I'm going to ask a couple of my friends to come out who are going to share a little bit about what's happening in the nations of the earth as we work our way towards responding to this final mission field. This is Dominic Russo from One Nation, One Day. Thank you, Andy. You're a true brother. We love you, man. In the fall of 2011, after several years of doing traditional missions work and evangelism, at 26 years of age, I found myself in the office of the president of Honduras. I said, Mr. President, I know the nation is in pain. Unemployment's rising. They're calling this the world's murder capital because there's the highest homicide rate per capita than in any other nation outside of a war zone. And the nation's been in pain. But there's a scripture in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8. And the prophet Isaiah asks the ancient question, can a nation be saved in one day? I said, Mr. President, what if in part Isaiah was speaking to this moment in your history? What if all of Honduras could be changed, could be healed, could be saved in one day? I said, Mr. President, we have a vision that comes from this question, but we'll only begin if you'll agree to these five things first. On Saturday, July 20, 2013, stand with me and together from the nation's capital, we'll speak to the entire nation. Second, pass legislation through your Congress calling One Nation One Day an official national holiday. Third, open up every public high school in the entire nation and allow our missions teams to come and do a one-hour school-wide assembly with an altar call. Four, open up the ports and borders and allow us to ship container loads of books and humanitarian aid without any taxes or hang-ups at the borders. And number five, and this was the big request, would you give us the 18 largest stadiums in the capital cities of all 18 states across the nation for free? Now, we didn't know what the president was going to say, but he began to sign a resolution, and six months later, the bill passed unanimously through Congress, and one nation one day with all five provisions became law in the country. In the span of seven days, 1.1 million people were reached for the gospel. And on the front page of every newspaper were these words, we have a new Honduras. A year later, I was in the office of the new president, Juan Orlando. He said, Dominic, I was there in the Olympic Stadium. It was the most spectacular moment in our nation's history. I don't know if you know, but for 25 years, we had teacher strikes. The last 12 months, we haven't had one day of missed classes for the first time in over two decades. He said, we've had a violence diminished by 38.2% nationwide. We have a new country. What's amazing is the miracle was continued to happen. It happened again in the Dominican in 15 and Nicaragua in 2017. And right now, we're six months away from gathering and mobilizing the largest international missions team in history, a team of 10,000 to the nation of Peru this summer, the last week of June. And together with the spiritual fathers and leaders of the nation, we have made a goal that through the outreach, five million people would come out of the kingdom of darkness and be brought into the kingdom of light. Do you believe it tonight? I want to echo one of the cries of this movement. I don't believe as the body of Christ we've simply entered into a new season because seasons come in cycles. A season is a glimpse of something we've seen in the past. I believe today and even now we've entered into a new era and in this new era God is moving on his people and through his people as never before in human history. Tonight, if we could see Jesus inviting us, saying like he said in Matthew, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as a seed. He doesn't say if you have faith like Abraham. He doesn't even say if you have faith like John the Baptist or King David. He says if you have faith like a seed, and not just any seed, a mustard seed, which is the tiniest of all seeds, you could command mountains to move. And then check this out. Nothing would be impossible for you. We know he said nothing's impossible with God. 
But today, in this stadium and across the earth, hear these words from our Lord. Nothing will be impossible for us. And it's as simple as getting alone with Jesus and saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't know that I have the faith like a Lauren Cunningham or, or a Bill Johnson or a Lou Engel or Andy Bird. Lord, I don't know that I have that faith. But Lord, in this moment, I give you the innocent, childlike trust of my heart. And he looks back down at us and says, son, daughter, that's all I need. And we have an invitation even now. Think about what as the church we've been able to leverage our faith, faith for in the last hundred years. We've stepped out into faith for physical healings in a new way. Faith for buildings, faith for real estate. I hear an invitation from heaven. It's time for us as the people of God to leverage our faith for entire nations laid at the feet of Jesus in one day. It's time for us to leverage our faith for access. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that as the church, we don't just gather for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning, but as the people of God, it's now our time to step into the office of presidents and the highest offices of government, at the head of boardroom tables, in mass media communication. It is time for the church to take our place and lead. The Great Commission wasn't given simply so that the church would go. If that were the case, he would say, go make, simply go make converts. But instead he said, make disciples of nations. If I'm going to disciple an individual, I have to lead an individual. If we're going to disciple nations, it's time for the people of God to assume our rightful place and lead nations and bring transformation to nations. It's time for us to lead all across this building if you're hungry for it tonight if there's a seed stirring for the impossible inside of you if you want to stand between heaven and earth and lay entire nations at the feet of Jesus I invite you to stand with me all across this place and lift your hands to heaven hear Jesus say to you if you have faith like a mustard seed. If you have the smallest amount of authentic trust and confidence, nothing will be impossible for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you tonight that we as the people of God, as the body of Christ, are enter into, entering into the best decade of ministry history since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that these next 10 years, we will stand in moments that believers for generations have longed for. It's not five years away. It's not 10 years. We have entered it now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. Amen. Isn't it amazing to be in a country where we can gather in the thousands? It's amazing. I, my wife and I flew here from a country that we live in where the indigenous population, there are less than 100 known believers in the whole country. And then I look around here, I've just been weeping all day, just so excited to be around other Christians. And I was at a gathering like this in 2007 in Nashville. It's called The Call. I was 17 years old, some of you were there, I was, it was hot, and I was just, my hands in there saying, God, do anything with my life. I was just so excited for Jesus. A few years later, I was 20 years old, jumped on an airplane, I moved to the Middle East. I thought, this is a good step. I moved there, had no idea what I was getting into, didn't speak the language, didn't know the culture, but I was sure God was going to use me. And someone said to me, I was 20 years old, and they said, what are you doing? You're giving your best years away. You're giving up your best years to Jesus. Well, I, I kind of thought, what do they know that I don't know, giving something up? And I, I started to kind of swirl out. You know how it is if you're 20? I just want to encourage you if you're 20, you'd, it's okay. You're going to be all right. 
And I'm, but I'm starting to think, man, I'm here in the desert. What about marriage? What about a career? Like, what if this stuff doesn't work out? I'm starting to get in my head, thinking about my own life, my own future. I was so excited about God, and it took me to the Middle East. And then I'm starting to figure, worry about my own life. And then I, this amazing thing happened. One day I was walking down the street, and this guy was walking towards me. He was a young guy. He's probably not much older than me. And I'm just going to be honest with you, he was dressed like traditional, really religious. He had a robe on, a big long beard, he had the hat on, shaved mustache. Be totally honest, I just judged him. I thought, man, that guy probably hates me, he probably hates my religion, he probably hates my country, all this. I'm just judging him. And then I, in, like, in my mind, just, it was like a movie in front of my eyes. I saw that same young guy, but this time I saw him in a room with stacks and stacks of books about God in front of him. And in this picture in my mind, he starts opening up every book and reading it from cover to cover until he gets to the very last book. He reads it and he found no answer. And then the Holy Spirit said to me right there, he said, this young man's looking for God and no one's told him where to find him. It just broke my heart right there on the street. And I realized in my own mind, I was so worried about my own life, not realizing that I have, I have life and life abundant in Jesus, right? I'm stoked about that. We're stoked about that. But there are so many people who don't even have that chance. And it made me think about what Jesus said in Matthew 16. He said, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And now I, where I grew up and the way we talked about it, we really focused on the lose part. We were real excited about losing stuff. I don't know what that was about, but I think we maybe got it wrong. Because I don't think Jesus was excited about the losing. I think he was excited about the finding. I think he was, he was excited about a whole generation of people who would actually find life in him. That would give up all the plan B's. You know plan B's where it's like you're so excited about God and what he's doing. And you say, do it, but if it doesn't work out, I have this other plan. Like, if it doesn't work out, maybe I'll apply for university. Or if it doesn't work out, maybe I'll uh, get back on to eHarmony. No, no one would do that. But, you know, if it doesn't work out, maybe I'll fall back on this plan. But I, here's the reality, guys. I don't think anyone ever changed the world with a plan B. I think, I think people that change the world are people that lose their life because they're like, you know what? God has a life that is far more than I could expect or even imagine. That's what Ephesians says. That is beyond what we could ask or even imagine. And now I've been in the Middle East for like, it's almost nine years. And all I can say is it's above what I could ever ask or imagine. And I don't think those, I don't want to say the people behind, like when I was young were wrong saying go and die. Like I'm sure that God anointed that message for the time. But I want to tell you guys in this missions moment, talking about the nations, I want to say guys, listen to me, go to another nation and find a life you can't imagine. And there's something about the life unimaginable that Jesus has for us that is actually found in letting other people find their life. Just a couple weeks ago, this was amazing. This group, this group of 30 young people came to our city where it's like totally illegal to preach the gospel. And they said, can we preach the gospel? I said, no, but we should do it. And so they start, they rent hotel rooms, like hotel conference rooms, and they go and give people flyers saying, come, we're going to play music and talk about Jesus. So I show up, and I was like, I don't know how this is going to go, and if they all go to jail, it's kind of my fault. And I show up, and you know who walks in? All these people, covered up in all black, head covered, you can only see their eyes. They start coming into the room, and these young guys, no shoes on, I don't know why, they just couldn't afford shoes, and they're just playing their music, and they're pre and they preach about Jesus and share their testimony. It was amazing. At the end of the night, I turn around, and this one woman's behind me from one of the most Islamic countries in the world. And I, I said, what did you think? And you know what she said? She said, we accept Jesus in our heart. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I want to tell you, my friends, God has a life for you that's above what you could ever expect or imagine. You'll find it when you lose your life, but it's not about the losing. It's about the finding. And there are whole nations of the world that have never had the opportunity to find. Every day, almost, I talk to someone who's never even heard of Jesus. And I want to tell you guys, come, join me. I've lived my whole life, my, all of my 20s in the Middle East, and I haven't missed out on a thing. I've only found more of Jesus and helped other people find him too. So come, join me, and let's go see nations safe for Jesus. Amen?